I'm thrilled. <laughs> See, I need to be thrilled. So uh, if you're not done with the imagination yet, that's okay. Um, some of you start turning them in. Uh, some of you are still kind of finish up little things. Um, some of you have turned in almost done ones and I'm putting in grades um, for those, but I'll put down in the note sections of Power School um, if I think you're missing stuff or, or what I think you can do to improve. Um, I had a really great one, what's today, the day's the 31st, about two days ago, um, that was pretty much done. And you can see where like the outline was, but the person needs to finish shading it in. So what we're gonna do now is, um, we've, we've worked our imaginations a little bit, so now we're gonna work on something easy because it's gonna be right in front of you. Um, and we are going to use an ancient way of drawing. So first thing we're gonna do is, I'm gonna share my screen. See, I start to move and I don't remember that you guys can't see what I see. Oop. So right now, um, the ancient Egypts had what was called a canon of proportions. And basically, um, art in ancient Egypt wasn't free form. So what you guys do is, is you make art for art's sake. You make art for a purpose, you make art to fulfill an assignment. Um, but when you're in your free time, you do art the way you want. Uh, in Egypt, art was a job and everything was done according to a certain set of rules. So there wasn't a lot of free form art. So when we look at it, uh, I'm just gonna click into uh, this images for Egyptian grid drawing. And we know that the canon of proportions um, exists and the reason behind the canon of proportions is it's a way to lay things out in a very precise manner because it's important for Egyptians how things are viewed. So let we'll just pop up these guys right here and uh, things that are laid out. So this is, this to me looks like a, a, a kid's kind of worksheet a little bit, but we always have the front view of a chest because that's the best view of chess. We always have side views of heads because it gives us that nice profile of the head. We always see hands with thumbs um, in front of. So I can tell this isn't a real Egyptian drawing because there should be a thumb showing up here. And sometimes they put the hands on backwards just to give you the best view. Legs are done in profile. So it's kind of a torquey twisty uh, torso that you see here. Ooh, I Whoa. <laughs> that. Um, we're going to go to, here we go. So this guy, we're going to make it a little bit bigger, we hope. Well, that's not that much bigger. And it's not that good one. So this is Nefertiti um, laid out, and this would be a carving for a tomb. And you can see they've superimposed a grid over it. Um, the idea was that no matter where these carvings or statues were going to be done, they had to be the same. So the size of the head has to be the same, whether it's a really small piece or whether it's a 20 foot tall statue. Uh, the way the arms are positioned, the way the body is laid out has to be the same, no matter where it is seen. So, <laughs> so um, the idea behind this grid method is to make things correct across your planes, to be able to reproduce things accurately. Now the nice thing about the grid method is when we're using it, it's going to help us maybe we have some issues. One of the downsides to it is, is sometimes we become locked into our grid. So uh, first thing we're going to do is we'll make a one inch grid across our paper. Um, we're going to do this on notebook paper, so or not notebook paper, we're going to do this in sketchbook paper, so um, 8 by 11 size paper. So you'll have eight vertical lines and you'll have 11 horizontal lines. Um, you'll have seven vertical lines and you'll have 10 horizontal lines <laughs> because one, two with one line. Uh, one of the things we can do though is, is in areas, and we can look at her lips here and her lips look like something's not right. 
um, you can subdivide your grid smaller so that when you're looking at it, the area that you're looking on becomes an easier um, view. And these details you can get laid out correctly. When we look at her eyes, her eyes are nicely laid out. Her nose looks like it's a little funky in there, um, but the hair is nicely laid out. <coughs> so when we go back through, one of the things, um, a lot of the cameras, a lot of your cameras now, you can put a grid on the yeah. really big squares. Um, yeah, this is, this is the art room. Uh, this is unnamed female student. How's that? Um, these big squares, I mean, that leaves a huge chunk of information. And if this had another line dividing these in half, it would be a better setup for our grid. So what we're looking for is, um, and this is a little simple doodle. Do, 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 So this will be our practice homework this week. I'll put this up. Um, and you guys, can, you guys don't have to download it if you don't want to. Um, you can just draw this like in your sketchbook. But if you want to, you, you can print it and then do it that way. Um, the idea here is this grid and this grid um, though the sizes are different, um, this is a smaller grid, it's the same number of squares. So this is a enlargement grid where this is two times bigger than, than the size here. So these might be quarter inch and these might be half inch. So you're doubling the size of this drawing in this space. Uh, it's a simple line drawing of a sailboat and some clouds and maybe some waves in the background. But the idea behind this is you can use the grid to increase or decrease size. You put down your base grid on a picture and then you figure out your multiplier for how big you want things to go. So for us, um, we're probably going to use a cell phone or the camera on your Chromebook or computer to take your picture. And then um, if we want to, uh, you can use a program. If you're on a Chromebook, you can use like Photopea and you can impose a grid over the top of that picture. Boop -a -doop. So uh, I have a rubric that I'm gonna pop out for you guys. But we are going to do self-portraits. Same site. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there's the American artist Chuck Close. We're gonna poke into him real quick. Um, he is considered a photorealist. That's Chuck. Um, that's Chuck now. And all of these things you're seeing in front of you are paintings, either oil or acrylic that Chuck does using a grid system. Uh, about the, I wouldn't say too early, but, but early in his career, he starts to expose the grid. So a lot of realists and photorealists lay a grid out on their area, whether they're drawers or painters, and then they draw one square at a time. Um, so the community, when Chuck starts to do these paintings, and people can see the grid. People are like, what are you doing? You're giving away our secret. And, uh, and he, he says, you know, people should know how to do this. Um, and he goes, and anyways, I'm using the grid to make these color patterns. So if you get really close to the screen, you're gonna focus in on these little shapes. But when you look back at a distance, you can see eyes, ears, hair, and he's playing with the use of color. Uh, sometimes he does these paintings in color. Sometimes he does them in black and whites only. And let's see if there's, oh my gosh. Um, did he do the one that's at the art museum? <laughs> yes, we do have a Chuck. Okay, so here we go. This is a better share screen. Um, we have, so the fun thing about Chuck is all of his paintings are done of personal friends um, or family that he knows. Uh, Chuck has a rare condition called facial phasia. And facial phasia means that he cannot recognize people's faces. So this is um, one of his Alex, and this is Alex standing next to it. 
Uh, this is from early in his career. Chuck does all of his own pictures. And then from those pictures, he now uses, um, he has um, like plastic or mylar sheets that have grids on them. So instead of drawing each grid, he lays a plastic sheet over and he has different grid patterns. And then from that, he does these large paintings. So this is um, Alex standing next to his portrait. And um, actually, is that Alex or is that Chuck? That could be a, yep, that is a young, young Chuck, 1968. Um, we have an Alex at the museum. So if you notice, Chuck here is, you know, six foot tall. That's a 12 foot canvas. So he has these very large transfer images. Um, this is super early in his career, 1968. Chuck, um, in uh, just as his career is starting to take off, just as he's doing one-man shows and people like this guy is going to be an artist to, to, to watch and learn about, um, he suffers a condition where the um, arteries uh, in his neck actually are twisted around each other and start to choke off the blood flow. And they think he has a stroke. And then they think he's paralyzed. And he now is, he actually is in a wheelchair. Um, he has regained partial use of his lower legs. Um, and he has some use of his arms and hands. So he actually has to wear um, a brace on his arm. And then he pushes his paint brushes into the brace to hold them because he can't grip the paint brushes. Uh, he also, um, he has to, so he has like a couple of wheelchairs that he uses depending on what he's doing. If he's in a wheelchair, just like sitting in a rolly chair, he can move his lower legs and feet enough to kind of move himself. But for most of his mobility, he has to use a motorized wheelchair. Um, I believe Chuck is in his mid eighties now. And um, so it affected him later on uh, i'm going to show you so i'm going to show you that portrait again with a couple others and this is from his i think either his first uh, studio or um his i think this is his first studio not his graduate work um but here is this portrait here is similar to this is uh to me this is probably one of his sketches done and then this guy you can't see in there, but these are um, two from 1968, this one from 1969. <laughs> now I'm being really cautious because they've got the website. Um, yeah, can't show that one. <laughs> I was just about to, and then I was like, oh no, can't do that. So this one here shows his studio again. Double check, yep. So when you're looking at these, these are, so the titles for his work are simply who they are, Phil, um, Bob, uh, when it's a, this has a date from 69 to 70, uh, Chuck does not take a long time to do paintings. He is a, a machine when it comes to doing his artwork. Um, there's a lot of famous quotes, especially for artists, and I like to use them. I'll use them in the classroom sometimes. Um, things like, uh, it's a fool who waits for inspiration. Um, art is just like any other job. You get up in the morning and you go do it. So, and, and he said, um, he talks about, uh, I have this nice movie that we're probably not gonna watch, um, that he talks about like growing up as a child, he was an only child, his parents, um, his dad made most of his toys when he was a kid. Um, he came from a working class family, but his artwork was good enough um, to help him like get through school. When he was in high school, his teachers thought that he was just dumb or lazy, um, but he, he's kind of ADHD a little bit. Um, he has this problem with facial phasia. So he couldn't remember some of the facts, but to show like his history teacher that he really was in, into his lessons and really paid attention, on his high school wall, um, he painted a mural, probably 20 feet long, of Lewis and Clark's journey. And um, to prove to his history teacher, hey, I really am paying attention. I do know what's going on. Uh, when you look here, you can see all of this wall are either photographs or drawings he's doing 
And then he takes these and to make it more predominant, he does them large scale. His average size is about eight feet tall. Uh, I think the one that at the Toledo Museum of Art is an eight foot tall Alex. Um, we had a great person who made a, like a photo collage um, using like Photoshop and then do a large, did a large print, six feet tall of Chuck Close from Chuck Close self portraits. So uh, what we're gonna do is, um, and you guys have several ways you can do this. If you wanna do it from a mirror, you can do it from a mirror, a little bit tougher. Um, you could take a China marker or a wax crayon or a dry erase Sharpie, and you, not a dry erase Sharpie, a dry erase marker. And you can go to your mirror and simply mm -hmm. draw lines on it. Like uh, the Truman Show. <laughs> There you go. And then you can put a grid and then you can stare into that mirror um, and you can do this. If you have a small portable mirror, so I'm gonna stand for a second because I got one of these. <laughs> this is what I look at all day, guys. <laughs> you guys. So, and my dudes. So you could put a grid on this and then I see what this is. Um, it's got a little angle so I can set it and I can look from the mirror. You also, if you don't want to do that, you can pop out this device, take a selfie, and then um, there's a couple of programs on here. I have a grid drawing assistant. It's a free app. Um, there's one specifically, there's a grid program for an iPhone um, that you can use. You can print out your picture that you take, and you can draw the grid on the printed picture. Hard things that you're gonna to have to do is, um, we're gonna just do this, we're not gonna do these big, we're gonna do them notebook size. So on an eight and a half by 11 paper, I want the finish work, the finish work to live inside of that. So I would do a one inch grid. <laughs> I know that's cute up there. Dude, just take the sheets, man. <laughs> um, the, uh, the whole thing, so that means vertically and I do my grid this way. I do my grid like a carpenter uh, once told me. I measure from the same side of the paper at the top, I measure from the same side of the paper at the bottom. So one inch, one inch, one inch, one inch, one inch, one inch. And I go across the bottom, one inch, one inch, one inch, one inch. And then I connect my dots. I take my straight edge, and I connect my dots and I draw my lines. That way my lines don't slant or tilt because if I only put dots at the top, my, my ruler, my pencil, whatever may drift. But if I have a top dot and a bottom dot, I can connect those. And then I do the same for my horizontals. I usually start at the top and I work my way down. Start at the top, I work my way down. And then I connect my grid across. Make the grid really light. We don't want to see the grid when we're done. We want to have a nice, clean um, picture of you when we're all finished. It can be color if you want, or it can be um, black and white. Uh, Chuck goes back and forth between color and black and white. Um, I'm going to show you, uh, I'm going to show you, let me see if I've got, can't hit the work one. The work one is the bad one. Yeah. It makes me have to edit uh, the picture. Nope. All right. So we are going to look for a German artist who is a hyper realist. Um, and of course, it's a really weird. I apologize for not having these set up ahead of time. There he is. I just have to check his, okay, good. So I have to check his website, I know for sure. Um, so, uh. so we're gonna share this one. What you're looking at here is either a pencil graphite or a charcoal drawing. Um, he is, so uh, Dzmersky is a hyper-realist. And the difference between Chuck Close photorealism 
and Dirk Dzminski, hyperrealism is the fact of. Photorealists attempt to make a picture look like a photo. Hyperrealists go to the point beyond that where they attempt to make the shimmers and glows inside of an image. So now we're gonna find one that's even more interesting. Yeah, it's like real life. So hyperrealists are well known for, here we go, here's a good one. Okay, make, make sure we can't see around it, okay. Um, so this, Bob's, Bob's, I'm sorry. <laughs> this is a, um, this one is, I think, I think charcoal, I think charcoal. So they go so far as, so he'll take pictures, he'll, he'll have models set up and he'll pour water on them or he'll have them like in like what looks like a bubble bath just so that he can get this drippy liquid coming off of them. And then he works the exact same method we are, one square at a time. He does a rough outline and then he fills in and he'll work side to side or from center out on the grid. So I'll show you one that's about halfway through. Um, he also, he, he's not only a drawer, he is also a uh, painter. So he'll have pencil drawings, um, he'll have charcoal drawings, he'll have paintings, both acrylic and oil. Um, and he's changed his website too since uh, first try. Because I don't think I taught this last try. Now I'm gonna be really sad because his website used to have um, he used to have like shots from inside his studio and he, he did, so it showed him with his works. Um, his website is nicely broken down into graphite, charcoal, oils. So let's check this one out. Um, So this is done, this, these are all charcoal drawings. So the little soap bubbles here, the white, the really bright white that you see, or this bright white, he's gone back in and he's used an eraser to pull the charcoal off the paper. Um, he's using a heavyweight paper. Um, he's not using just a, a standard drawing paper just to make it look this good. There's the guy we just saw. So he is a charcoal. But you can see how you've got the water and you don't question water running on face when in reality, this is just a flat drawing. Uh, this is his website if you really wanna go look at his stuff. But again, <laughs> make sure there's no, no kitties about because um, sometimes he has some open things. Beautiful things like her kind of silverish gray hair. Now, obviously, if you look at her face, she's not an older woman. But if you were to just look at the hair, you might think, older woman because of the colors, but these are all done in charcoal. These skin tones are charcoal skin tones. Some of these whites he'll work on um, an off color paper. So he doesn't necessarily use a pure white paper. He'll use something that has a little bit of color to it when he starts. So some of these whites are actually white charcoal that he builds up the layers. And then this is Dirk wearing a jeweler's visor. So there's probably a light here um, or lights on the side so that he can really get in close to see details of stuff. Um, but this is, this is the sort of thing that a hyper realist does. So Chuck realism makes it look like a photograph. Hyper realism pushes it beyond um, to like high definition where you're questioning, are you looking at a photo or a drawing? Uh, we, are just going to use a grid to make us. So um, I'm gonna show you this one. Uh, one of my students, uh, second try, maybe first try, did this drawing. 
So um, she, she's tired of drawing self portraits and she said, fine, let me do a picture of you. So uh, it's an interesting angle. It's, an, it's a downward view. So she was standing up and I was sitting in my chair in the computer lab, I think. Um, no, I think I was in the classroom. And she took this shot of me, white paper. And um, she's been practicing all this, all this year, improving her realism look. So she went for, she was going for a realist finished look. Um, so when you come across here, the eyes are in the right planes, the ears in the right planes. Um, she was probably more generous in some of my hair zones than she should have been. Uh. Um, but you can see it was a Wednesday because I'm wearing my white shirt um, and she's got the wrinkles and the shadows being cast off of the collar. So this is what we're going for. No visible grid. And we're going to just try to make a picture that looks like us. So if it's me, the first thing I'm going to do is I want to find a picture of me that is pleasant to look at. Um, not something that I'm going to be upset with. So, Oh, so not my face. <laughs> that, that Andrew, it's face definitely going to be your upsetting. face. It's not. So um, what I don't want you to do is, is I don't want you to try something and you be frustrated with the final result. So like a couple times students will come in and they'll have like a hat on or they'll try to do these things. And yeah, but it's, it's going to kind of defeat the purpose. The purpose of the grid is to help you guys take a complex subject and make it simpler. Uh, when I get into tough areas doing this, so like this is no problem now because it's all furry and fuzzy. So well, that's easy for me. But when I'm working across like my eyes, I might take my one inch square and subdivide it so that it's actually quarter inches. And then on my big paper, I subdivide the big square. So that way I don't have to draw the eye as a whole. I can work on little sections of it at a time. Um, so the grid is there. The grid is the training wheel on your bicycle. It's gonna help you from falling over but when we're all good at it, we're gonna take those training wheels off and you're gonna ride the bike. So the drawing is gonna be your, your good bike when you're done. So I would start with finding a picture that I like. I get a ton of these pictures. No teeth, um, and you're gonna have requirements. You have to have at least an eye, at least a nose, at least part of a mouth, and at least one ear showing. Yo, 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 Cripster. So we can use pictures that like we've already taken Yes. And we don't have to be like, this is for my portrait, click. <laughs> yep, you can use something. If you're going to draw on it, try to use a copy. Or if you have a clear piece of, uh, blah, 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 yep. um, a clear piece of plastic to put over it to put the grid on, I would do that. So that way you don't ruin like mom's favorite picture of you, which for Andrew, that's only about four. Now he's not talking to us anymore. He might have, he might have taken a nap. Um, what, uh, what I would do second is I'm going to decide how big is my picture versus how big is my paper. So if I do a standard little picture, for example, a school ID, which is only yay big compared to my piece of paper, I need to measure and figure out how much bigger my grid is. So on here, if this is a one inch grid, then on something this small, my grid may only be, um, on something this small, my grid will probably be smaller than a quarter of an inch. Just to make sure that I get the same number of uh, vertical and horizontal lines and have my grid come out nicely. Uh, last but not least, I want you to challenge your abilities. So if you know you can do this, then maybe do a picture from an interesting angle and try to uh, get that in. All I need um, the, for the picture is from neck collarbone, neck collarbone to top of head, one eye, part of a nose, part of a mouth, and part of an ear to be shown. 
um, that's the minimum. If you want to do a whole body, you can do a whole body. So if you want to try something tricky, do something tricky. If you want to include friends, you can include friends. Um, if you want to have multiple uh, parts of you, so I know some people will do a collage where maybe they've got a picture this way and a picture this way, and they'll combine those two into one graph. Um, it's up to you. Uh, the base is those, those facial features and as close to you as you can get. No matter color of skin, it's not the same color as your paper. So living in my basement, I'm pretty pasty white, but I'm not this pasty white. So everything's gonna get shading. You do not have to have a background. Background is optional. So this is one of the few times I'm gonna say uh, those happy words. If you wanna be creative, you can take and using your grid, you could put other things in your background or you can draw what you see. But if you have a really complex background and you're like, oh, I don't wanna do that, you can leave it blank or you could put yourself in space. Whatever comes to your desire and or imagination. Is there any questions about what we're gonna do? Besides have fun. Can I just like, you know, like not? <clears throat> All I heard Andrew say was he is so excited to do this, he can't wait for it. Oh, no. Andrew, I'm looking at your comment over to the side and I'm hoping that, that Nasty Gross Face Man is not necessarily me. <laughs> no. Um, so uh, did you guys hear yesterday the governor announced that we are definitely going to be close? Yeah, to that's garbage. So. Oh, I'm not. I'm not. We're basically not coming back to school for the rest of the year. So the prediction right now is that it'll peak in Ohio somewhere in the middle of May. Um, and if it does that. That means we would go back to school for like a week. Maybe, maybe a week at best too. Um, so the things that I'm going to start uh, today, I'm going to start to try to figure out with the team is what are we doing for graduation? Um, and then there's going to be a, Watch. If you guys don't watch Mr. Giha, he puts on like video announcements um, or his tweets or any of that message for the district. You need to start paying attention to those um, because as a school, we're starting to figure out what's happening next. Um, no state testing this year. What about so, exams? Um, we don't have an answer yet. I'll probably exempt anyway. Yeah, you, you come. You come to all these. Bryant comes to all these. So um, what we're gonna do is, uh, I would expect by Thursday, you guys have some pre-sketches done. Um, you practice your grid. Remember, okay, so the two biggest mistakes that people are gonna make. One, they're gonna have a, a wanky grid. It's not gonna be straight, it's gonna be wobbly. They're gonna have some things that are big and some things that are small. And that's going to give you problems. That's problem one. Two, um, I'm sorry. And in grids, they put too heavy of a line so that they can't erase it. So right down this, like right through the middle of their eyeball, they'll have a big heavy pencil line and they'll try to erase it and they'll get a groove. So it messes up their shading. Two, um, people jump over the grid to do their drawing. In other words, they, instead of working one square at a time, they try to do a whole drawing. They try to draw the whole thing at once. So um, inside of the imagination drawing, I said, lay out where your creature's going to be, but draw your background and, and take your background in sections. Then as you get closer and closer to the creature, then do the creature and then fill in that little gap. So take it one square at a time. I'm gonna look real quick and see, um, if I have a good studio shot from, man, that really upsets me uh, that he took down all those, darn you, Dirk. 
for uh, taking those guys down. I'm not even judging his culture, but that's a hilarious name. Yes, he's very German. Um, I remember when, uh, so he, he, he actually made uh, kind of some snide remarks when he was younger about Chuck Close and his photorealism. And that used to make me angry, um, but he's, a, he's an outstanding artist. Oh, so I'm gonna show you this shot here. So this is him in studio working. And one of the key things is he has a piece of paper that is acting as a rest point for him. So he's, he's got his photograph here, he has his painting here, but this way his hand doesn't touch the paper. That's a big thing you're gonna to wanna to do. Um, the, the natural oils from our hand, the fact that we are cleaning them so much and then having to put lotion on them to keep them from drying completely out. Um, you don't wanna get chemical or grease or, uh, or oil stains on your paper. It's gonna cause you uh, some problems when you're working. Um, boy, see this is what I get for not double checking uh, these guys. Treading lightly. Paper stuff. There it is. So uh, we are doing self-portrait graph enlargements. Now, the base is self-portrait you graph enlargement. If you wanna try to bump it up a little. If you say, hey, Mr. Abel, I can do this, it's no problem. Then my challenge back to you will be, how do you make this skill appropriate? So perhaps you decide that you're going to be, um, if you can do a self-portrait, no problem, then maybe you give yourself little fawn horns and little deer ears, and you give yourself a little speckly face um, so that you look like a fey creature. Uh, maybe you decide that you're part Native American and you're going to research a little bit of your ancestry and part of your face um, is done in a tribal design or a tribal pattern. Or you just pick some tribe because you think it looks cool. Um, you go through, um, if you search in uh, the African tribal site, uh, it, if you look at the traditional tribals uh, site, there's like 400 different tribes that it'll pop up and it'll give you different masks, artwork, and patterns for each one of those groups. And you can make yourself um, interesting that way. So if you think self-portrait is no problem and your skills allow it, then modify with a grid. If on the other hand, I say the word self-portrait and you cringe a little bit inside and um, your, your mother tells you things like you have a face that only grandma will love, then... Um, <laughs> I knew that would get Andrew awake again. Um, then you're going to work really hard on trying to make you the best looking you you can. Brian's got his picture all ready to go. He's hand under his chin. He'll call I have it one in mind. Corona me. Oh, you dumb little idiots on your phones, ooh. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> um, you as a uh, weird smiley face. At first I thought you were showing me Powerpuff Girls. Distorted sad emoji. No, just a bunch of like the edited emojis <laughs> expressions that aren't on the regular keyboard. This one's favorite. <laughs> No, I lied. This is me throughout this entire trimester. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of, tell you, man, <laughs> as much as sitting here in the basement is awesome, um, when it's not flooding, that is, uh, it is, it's not the same thing as like sitting in the room with you guys and being able to do fun things. And now I have to remember to go back and fix the video. Man, that's my college's to be like, Shelby, you broke <laughs> up and froze right in the middle of that. 
Uh oh, what did Andrew just send me a link oh. to? Did you hear what I said? I did not. I am not. Anyway, I said college is better because it can just be like Bob's and then everyone's like art and then they clap. Yeah, I call them. Yeah, bobs. that's that's not how college went. <laughs> I can still remember my painting professor who basically didn't like us. <laughs> Those are scary looking emojis, Andrew. Oh my gosh, hold up. He said wrong link i'm yeah. not even gonna open it then send me the right one figure it out nope you can't emoji in zoom sorry <laughs> that's your emoji that's how i feel um so do you guys have questions about what we're doing no I will post that worksheet into uh, Google Classroom today. Um, again, you don't have to download it. I would make a small half inch grid and then try to transfer the, the sailboat into the half inch grid. And then um, my next thing I would do is I would put a one inch grid on my, in my sketchbook paper. Hold on to your, your heavier tag board. Um, we're gonna set that one aside. We're gonna do that project after this. Um, the project after this will be dealing with comics. Because I figure I'll, I'll keep you working on realism and then I'll break you and teach you how to do comic work. Wait. <laughs> All right.